So the lecture is the link between design and storytelling. If you can't hear me in the back row, uh, row just raise your hand because I can kind of go a little slow. Uh, so what I like to do to begin with uh, when I do these lectures is start with a couple quotes. I'm going to go through a few quotes. And the reason why I do that is just to kind of give you some context what artists uh, were thinking back in the day. And once you hear these quotes, you might assume what they mean, but after the lecture, if you go back and look at these quotes again, uh, you're probably going to see it from a very different perspective. So, the first quote, art is not what you see, but what you make others see, uh, by the great big guy. <laughs> okay? uh, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see by Mr. Thoreau, uh, the great Michelangelo, uh, a man paints with his brains, not with his hands, and go back to the This is actually really beautiful because this speaks to the intelligence of art. At one time, Artists were not like these starving creatures, you know. They were brought in and patrons of kings, and uh, you know, this, 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 there was something very, very regal about what we did. Um, and over time, we started separating the artist from certain aspects of society. And now it's kind of like, oh, the starving artist. And yet, on the flip side, you have doctors. And a lot of artists at one time wanted to be a doctor. I was going to go to medical school. And I said, eh, I don't want to cut people open, so I'm just going to draw pictures. But you talk to a lot of doctors, and they had that struggle as well. They wanted to be an artist, but they ended up going to be becoming a doctor because that was more practical. Uh, what's interesting is if you look back in history, there's a guild. You can't find a painter's guild. In, in, there's no painter's guild. Because the painters were in the medical guild, because back in the day, you had to know anatomy, biology, botany, you know, all the sciences chemistry, um, you know, if you wanted blue, you had to know how to make it, or where to go and dig it out of the earth, and how to, how to produce it, not just go down to the local art store, so, come big. Um, and then, Picasso, the beautiful Picasso. Uh, there are painters who transform a yellow spot, uh, I mean, from the sun into a yellow spot, but then there are others, thanks to their art and intelligence, uh, transform a yellow spot into the sun. So if we see the sun out there, and we go to our canvas, and we say, oh, it's a circle, and it's yellow, there, I made the sun. That's one way of doing it. But if you look at it, and you say, wow, it radiates, it's warm, it, it vibrates, uh, we can feel it, it gives off light, and you're able to capture that, which is invisible, put that in your hand, now you're badass. Okay, so, so when we go through this process, there are three questions that we want to ask, okay? Everything comes back to this one question, which is, how does this support your story? And, and for us at the Academy, stories are your intent. What is it that you, what do you want the end user to experience? That's what the first quote was about. It's not drawing what you see, but what you want others to see. What is that end user experience? And then how do you manage these elements to achieve that goal, okay? So, quick question. What do you see here? What? What are you talking about? Are you smoking this morning? There's no triangle there. There is no triangle there, and yet we see it, we experience it. It's invisible. And if, by, uh, through the alignment of lines, we can bring you into a realm that doesn't exist. Okay? That's cool. Go on. So, Sorry, it's too early in the morning. So how do you manage your spaces to support your story? I've never done this with the <laughs> uh, how do you support I mean, how do you manage your values and yes it's a zebra black um, to support your story? And we're gonna go and, and I'm gonna analyze one work of art for each of these so that you get an idea of how the illustrators and fine artists told their stories through these things. So, uh, who knows who this artist is? That's right. Does anyone know who this one is? That's Picasso as well. Okay. He painted this when he was 14 years old. Actually, that's him. That's his sister, his mom, and his dad. Um, the reason why I show them, he was 50 when he did this one. 
He's experimenting with subject, styles, all kinds of cool things that everyone thinks art is about. But you can see at 14 years old, he was executing work at a level that people who are in the art world for 40, 50 years still can't even come close to in many, many cases. Sincere, dedicated artists, but untrained. And when, even though they might have gone to school and done all these things, it, the, the knowledge isn't presented as it used to be. So at 14, he's executing at this level. At 50, he's having lots and lots of fun. But what's interesting, if you analyze the line, space, and values in these, they're all brilliantly orchestrated. So again, the target is the story, the intent. We're going to use line, space, and value. Uh, so what is a line? At the academy, we break it down really, really simple. A line is a mark, a thrust, an edge, or an alignment that leads your eye. So if your eye moves, it's a line that did it. So if this purple line is invisible, right, that's a line, these would be called marks. They're the things that actually trigger the line. So in this case, we have three marks. There is no line that connects it, and yet you see the line. You feel the line. That's the difference. You see this, you feel that. You don't believe me? Okay. So you feel the curve, even though there's an icon of a dog, a big long mark, and three dots. Here's an alignment. You feel the line through these marks. But if we shift, just a just slight shift, now we have two lines. It breaks it. And so when we're designing, we have to be very, 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 very careful and manage the nuances because you can make or break a piece of work by shifting a line out of place. That's why a lot of beautiful art has a horrible signature on it and it destroys the painting. It's kind of like getting a tattoo of across your face. <laughs> so that's where we want to be. So this takes great care. This takes great intelligence. It takes uh, detail. You have to be OCD. We actually embrace our OCD at the Academy. So we call it the cute OCD with the beautiful OCD. You know, it's our gift. So uh, we always want to make things align. So this is Norman Rockwell. Um, he happens to be my favorite uh, illustrator, artist. Um, there's a, an essay that I do on the difference between Rockwell and Hitler. <laughs> and because Hitler was an artist as well. Rockwell was an artist, and back in their days, they used art and design not, but they used it to um, basically create a mindset for a nation. So a lot of times when we see very wholesome things in the United States, we'll call it Rockwellian. <laughs> see, what happened one day, Rockwell came out of a, a, a cafe, and he saw somebody get stabbed. He said, what the hell, he was in New York. And he, he left New York and went away. He said, I'm going to paint the world as it ought to be, not the way it is. And that's what he did. So he has all these beautiful, wholesome images of community, family, things like that. Um, and, and so he's powerful. So in this image, we're going to look at line because I imagine him in his studio. The art director calls him and says, Rocky boy, we need an image. We need an image. Uh, it's football season, American football season. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, but we can't pick a winner, so come up with an idea. And he's probably walking through his studio flicking up a coin, and then it hits Eureka. See, when you flip the coin, you go like this, and the coin flips, right? So, click the next slide. <laughs> this is the geometry of this design. This is the energy, the invisible part. Tesla said, if you really want to understand the secrets of the universe, Think in terms of energy, frequency, vibration. This is the energy. It sets a vibration. It moves you through the image. The context, the physical part of it, doesn't really matter. It can be trees. It can be dogs. It doesn't matter. If this happens, if your eye moves and feels that, you'll feel the, the coin toss, OK? So your eye moves through with the image. Oh, go back. Two. Now look at that and tell me if you do not move through that image that way. Okay, you see the jets coming through, coming curved through here. Even the trees over here, then they bend in this direction. At least have a little coin. Um, okay. So now when the coin gets up here, it has to drop. 
And so Rockwell, one of his quotes was, he doesn't think about color or texture until his drawing and his design is perfect. So this is the design part. The drawing is the, how do you render the person? Does it look like a person type of thing? So he uses the stripes of the shirts. He uses the, the verticalness of the legs, the guy's uh, neck. All of these elements uh, to basically drop that coin very quick, very fast, boom, to the ground. So this is what's happening beyond what you see. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that's the design. That's the power. That's what you feel. It's not how the person was rendered. Okay? So there it is. It's a beautiful, simple, amazing design. So, story. And then in this case, we use line to uh, explain it. Now, he did go into space and value, but we didn't go into that because we only have eight minutes. So, let's go. Now, this is Max Phil Parrish, who's another great American illustrator. Uh, this is called Ecstasy. Um, so, with here, you can feel the lines pulling you up in that direction. Click. See? Click. Okay. Now, you feel that direction. You see it in the clouds and her hair, all that wonderfulness. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about value. Value is the relationship between light and dark. That's it. So, and there's different strategies you can use for value. If you need to have elements in an image to have their own integrity, but not be overly contrast, so your eye doesn't really pay too much attention to that area, you use low contrast values, things that are very similar. If you need the eye to go to a specific area, like in this graphic, this is where your eye will go to, because it's the highest point of contrast, and you want to control those things. Okay, so here's the image in grayscale. You can really, really see the lines pulling you in this direction. Now, here, that's a very, that's a, that's a nice contrast against the light in the sky, and it's really pushing you into that thrust, okay? Guys, don't look too, too much. But this is a nice contrast under her skirt as well, okay? And then we come down here to the rocks where you have another high point of contrast. Now, if you notice that when you're looking at these, what's happening is everything above this line is pulling you here. Everything above this line is pulling you down. Click. Like that. Okay? Now, what happens... Can you click backwards? Now, uh, what happens here is if you see her legs, they're very low contrast in the background. So what happens is even though she's standing on the ground, we actually feel her lifting off the ground. Okay? Because that's what the design is telling us. We, we don't want to trust our eyes. So that's, that's, that's you know, there's a great quote that says, uh, uh, words lie, but energy does it. Design is energy. When you look at a work of art, uh, look at the energy. Okay. Now, you may not think uh, that this is real, so let me show you another one. Okay. So this is Icarus, another Maxwell Parrish painting, okay? Does everyone know the story about Icarus? Okay, he flopped. But he's standing on the ground. High point of contrast, what's beautiful about this, it creates like a tone line, so you can actually feel him swinging out, it's really beautiful. His head is over with the birds. This is this beautiful arc that's coming through, this beautiful curve over here. Um, but when you come down here, he has a sword. He doesn't need a sword. A sword is irrelevant to the story, but it's extremely important to the design. Actually, I saw a Rockwell painting where he was uh, uh, our first president, George Washington, in the United States. And Rockwell did a picture, and he used the sword, and it was, let's just say. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you can see how this is a high point of con I mean, uh, this is a high contrast, and it's a very low contrast in his leg. So he uses the same exact technique here to allow us to, to, to or Icarus that lift off. So squint your eyes and watch him, his feet go. It's animated. It's, it's cool. So, uh, <coughs> now he even uses the same temperature and color as the clouds. So, 
by having this green here, that dark value, it splits your eyes, he's floating. That's freaking cool. <laughs> Again, a story, line, space, power. Talk about that. Now we're going to get into some space. Four minutes and 41 seconds. Give me a Come on. <laughs> oh. Let's do these next slides. There. Oh. Go back. Right This is uh, in Milan. Uh, front. Front. I can't pronounce it very well. I'm um, sorry. This is amazing painting. Uh, this is called All Saints Day. Uh, obviously, it's about these people going to church on this religious day. Uh, they're bringing flowers to give to dead people, I guess. I, I, I don't know. Um, but that's what they're doing. But what he does is freaking amazing. First of all, let's look at the line that he uses. You can see a curve in the back of that woman's back, right? But if your eye follows that curve, it comes up through the trees, and you see the contrast here, the dark through the light, so it connects it. So what happens is, Emil wants us to feel that the adults are ignoring this man. So how do you do it? You just look over the man. That's how you make you, that's how you ignore somebody. You just look over them. And that's what he forces you to do. So then he comes back down. Put back again. You can see contrast in here, which <coughs> brings your eye back through to the little cup. Okay? With all of these people going to church, that man should be like flowing with his money or whatever. But he's broke. So um, that's the commentary in this image. Okay? Now, we're going to look at the straight line, which is really cool. Because we have a, a, a dominant vertical here, a dominant horizontal here. And then you have these beautiful uh, diagonals, all coming to the man's face. But they also are within the realm of the little girl. So she's coming here, focusing not just on the man, but his face, his humanity, his dignity. This comes down to, to show us that he's asking for help. But the curve makes us ignore him. Click. Click. Okay, so we're going to talk real quick about space. Space is basically anything that's not a line. Okay, so this is space, that's space, that's space, that's space, that's space. If it's not a mark, it's space. And we need to manage it. So let me show you what Emil did here. Um, we, we deal with three rectangles inside of space. We deal with a mother rectangle, which is the main rectangle of the canvas. Uh, it has a certain height. Inside that, if we take the height and and make it the width, we get a square. So that's found in all rectangles. If we take this rectangle and we flip it, and we shrink it down so that the height matches this, is what we call a reciprocal rectangle. And what's beautiful about this is you have this one diagonal, which is the same as here, it's just my distance. That's really, really important in design. I'll show you one. So here we have the mother rectangle, okay? Uh, we have the guy in this area, we have the, the, the people over here. So if we bring in the daughter rectangle or the reciprocal, you can see that this line, this alignment, see there's an alignment here that gives us the math, okay? The face of the women are on there, the back, the, the flowers, the child, the feet. So the women and the adults are on that side of the image. If we come this direction, from with the same with the other reciprocal from the other side, boom, he lands her hand on there. So what he did using space was to tell the story, which is the religious people over here, the little girl is isolated, she's set apart. Actually the word holy means to be set apart, which I think is beautiful. She's set apart in her own space. And then the man is within his own space. So we're gonna look at value real quick. We have a, dark, a high point of contrast up here. Light, the dark light gives us that contrast, which brings us here. He has a dark figure with a light, light area, and then the dark cup on top of it. And then number three, click. When I first saw this, there was a little cut in her hand, and I said, ah, Emil screwed up. I found someone who screwed up. And then I remembered he's a master, so he doesn't screw up. Uh, so I investigated, and I went in, click. You can see, I don't know if you guys can see that little cut there. Yeah, you would think so. Except for the fact that a little girl does have points, right? Especially probably back in those days. But when you look closer, the value 
you of what's above her hand and the background are exactly the same. The difference is, is that there's a temperature change. So what's right here is warm, what's right there is cool, and what she's holding is a flower. Click. See, she's holding one of the flowers. Um, I know it's very, very hard and it's kind of too light to see, but we can always bring it back up if you guys want to see it later. It's there. It's always that moment when somebody comes up and looks at it and goes, oh my god, it's real. So, um, <laughs> So she's holding the flower. So she's not giving him money, but she's giving him a flower, right? Because all of these people are bringing dead people these big bouquets of flowers, and here's this live, living dude, and she's living out the faith. You know, I mean, that's a very, very powerful essay, a very powerful message, um, and done in a very beautiful painting. But the design is what tells that story. It's what communicates that energy. So again, we go from story, line, space, and value. 54 seconds. You guys want to see another one? Yes. Right, let's go. So inside a rectangle, there are two diagonals going from each end of the rectangle. This is called a sinister diagonal. We use a sinister when you want something to be secreted or uh, 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 hidden. Okay. Nick. This is a Baroque diagonal. Baroques welcome you into the image. Now this works for us because we read right to left to right, okay? I don't know if you know Chinese people might not work the same because they're trained to read the other way, so it might work a little bit different. Um, but for us, we read this direction, so this is how it feels. Go back. The reason why this works is because if we start here, and this diagonal moves us here, and we naturally end there. That means what happens is we quickly go over here and we drop down. So we basically see everything in that image. Go back. But if we're forced here, then what happens is all this stuff we kind of bypass and we feel like we didn't see everything. Okay, so that's really, really uh, important. Click, click, click. So this is a Caravaggio painting. It's called the Doubting Thomas. Um, this guy, please. This is Thomas. He's like digging his finger around in Jesus' room. So, <laughs> we're gonna look at the line real quick. When you look at the line, the design here, everything spirals in to the little hole, okay? So, click, uh, actually go back one more. So just look at that for a second, <laughs> and uh, two more seconds. You can feel how all the curves are moving here. All of this, even like in his uh, the fabric, it's spiraling up into this little hole. Okay? Okay. So on the mother rectangle, we are using a sinister. And what that means is that there are things on this Baroque that are in alignment, but there's far more alignments that are going on in the sinister, so therefore the image has what we call a sinister feel to it. Okay? Uh, and sinister in Italian just means left. It doesn't mean like evil or anything. Um, so we have this sinister feel, which, like I said, once we come in here, we ignore what's going up here. Okay. If we come in with a square, this is called a rebated square, on this alignment is the edge of the wound. Okay. Sorry, that's the sound. They made that then. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> oh shoot, that's broadcast to how many countries now? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, so there's the, the alignment. Nick, if we bring in the reciprocal, the reciprocal, now you can see the shadow, the face of Jesus, um, all of these alignments, the hand, the other side of the wound, all built on that Baroque. So what the story is saying, in, in terms of the design, is this is a very secret and sacred moment. This is extremely important because it is like the foundation. The foundation of all rectangles is a square, okay? And it's inviting you into it. That's pretty, that's pretty freaking cool. Actually, this space is big enough for you to put another thing if you were able to see uh, in a better way. Um, and so, that's it. Wow. Hey, nice <laughs> so, <laughs> so now time for questions, if you have any. Um, I have one. 
yes. for a starter. Uh, so could you, you just said you were, you were studying medicine. How, how did they bring you to art? No, 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 I said I was going. Ah, you were going. Yeah, 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 and then I decided to go to a different college. Right? Okay, so what was it that you studied? I studied illustration. Illustration. But um, I was going to go for medical illustration. So I just went for, for illustration, uh, and I always wanted to go into the south part of the United States, so that's where I went to school. And, uh, but I'll tell you a cool story for the architect. I was a second year student uh, as an illustrator, and I had a buddy who was his first year architect student, and they had this huge design shoot with eight hours competition. So all of the master students and the architect students and the interior designers and the industrial designers, like all of their design uh, building, entered into this charrette. And so my buddy and I, we entered in, and uh, we had eight hours. So the first thing we did, which was the most important thing, is we went for a two-hour lunch. You don't get this gorgeous, not here. So, um, but what's brilliant is what's the first part of, of this thing? What is the most important thing? What is the, uh, the question that everything has to support? Your story, right? So what's the point of the design? So that's what we talked about for two hours over lunch. What was the point? See, Da Vinci says, the work of the master is to conceive the idea and to design it. The, the actual execution is left to the lesser mind. Okay, so you can think about that in a design firm. The people who get paid a lot of money are the people who think. The people who are just doing the grunt work don't get paid so well. It's not fair, but it actually is. But even in your own self, when you're designing and thinking of an idea, if you plan it out really, really well, then let's say you go paint, it becomes almost zen because a lesser mind takes over. You don't have to think, you can just enjoy it. And so it's like a lesser mind, so it works here for yourself. But so we entered this design charrette. Bottom line is because we knew how to design and storytell. We destroyed it. We won. It pissed off the school. Everybody was angry. When they gave us our money, we had to come at like 9.30 at night time, you know, in the dark. <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious. But, um, you know, this illustrator beat all these designers out because very few people actually know how to design. So it doesn't. And that's a beautiful thing. When you study these masters, they did sculpture, painting, architecture. Why? Because they were dressed. They got us that they're better painters than I, but because I remember I'm a draftsman first, I will be the one that they remember. What an arrogant son of a bitch. What do you, we remember him, we talk about him. Because he understood what was important. That was graphic, that was design. Next question. Yes. Uh, so, do you think that uh, those ideas you showed us, uh, they planned their paintings according to those lines and squares, or they just felt it? Well, let me ask you this. Did they have TVs? No. Radios? Cell phones? Were they distracted? They were distracted by their work. So they put in the craftsmanship that was required to make master work. That's all I would say. But after industrialization, 100 or so years ago, things had to be done very quick. And so you lose a lot of this, and then we kind of get into a place where, you know, we're just going to feel it, you know? And there is a part for that. When I teach, I teach that that feeling part happens in the story. You don't want to, Picasso said, when you make love to a woman, you don't measure her, right? <laughs> so, well, I guess after a couple of years, you can do that. Anyway. But, but, um, the, so there is a point where you have to access the unlimited, creative, intuitive nature. But then you take that and you bring it to a process where you make it real. The word geometry actually means the measurement of earth, the measurement of rock, right? So you get this idea that it's in the invisible, and you have to put geometry to it to actually make it real. And so the answer to your question is absolutely. It's been a lot of time. <laughs> Anyone else? I have a thought. Uh, you got one more. Uh. Um. All the pictures we are looking at, one would like uh, yeah, to tell a story as you were explaining. There's like a, a living scene 
How do you do the same exercise regarding uh, that nature, for example? I'm really sorry, I'm going to come back to you. I can't hear you. I'm just asking, how could we do the same exercise regarding the dead nature, for example? A dead nature? Still alive. Still alive. Oh, okay. Well, very simple. You've got to ask yourself, see, the, 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 the lecture is about going beyond, right? So if you stare at the still life and you copy it, all you are is a copier. You're not an artist. You're not a composer. You're a copier. And we don't copy it. Right? So you have to ask yourself, what is it about that still life that you want to communicate? The reality is everything that we paint is a self-portrait. So when you do the still life, you have to ask, what is it that you want to communicate? Do you want to communicate courage? Well, you can do that for the alignment of, of the objects. Whatever it is that you want to communicate. Do you want to communicate relationship? You know, is that what you want to talk about in, in that? So, I would just start with the story and think about that first, and then align your still life to do that. Okay. And it doesn't have to be like a story like, you know, mom and dad went to the store. You know, it's not. It doesn't have to be a narrative. It just has to be. What What is it? Say, Don said, what we do is we share about sensations. So, what is the sensation that you want somebody to feel when you when they look at your still life, and then you you design it for that for that outcome. Um, sorry, just to build on that um, question, is it in a still life the the work almost starts before the drawing, right? Because the artist composes the still life. So is the story then told in, in that act of, of selecting the pieces and aligning and aligning them and placing them? Um, I try to encourage people to come up with the ideas first. A lot of students that I work with, they'll go out and they'll paint like lakes and, and scenes and things like that. They'll take photos of it and basically they end up copying those things. Okay. What I get to teach people is, is, is this really weird thing. It's almost like standing in a dark room full of objects but you can't see anything. And I show them a way of kind of almost using a, a, a visual sonar. <laughs> And all of a sudden, things start to come out of that darkness. And what's beautiful is they start composing 90%, maybe more, without looking at references. And then when they need those details to, you know, to, to, to get it, then they go back to the resources, the photos, or the lake, or wherever, to capture those details so that it is, that, it is that place. But very, very quickly, I move them from copiers to composers, and it just unlocks them. It's, it's just an amazing change in life. So I would really encourage you, rather than worrying about the objects, sketch it out, <laughs> think first, create it here, and then go get the objects that match it, and, and you're going to see the work just blossom. Um, so you mentioned that most of these artists were masters also because there was someone, there was some sort of uh, no distraction that you still have today. Is any artist today really present with something that you used to see? Because there's a lot of passion when you see these patients, these paintings. But is any contemporary artist present you in the same way? One that you can mention. <clears throat> the sad truth is very, very few. Very, very few. See, composition is like reading a book. You can appreciate the cover of a book. You can appreciate the layout of the work, but if you can't read, you're illiterate. You cannot tap into the power of that. I get irritated going to art museums with people because they want to see everything. I want to spend four hours on three paintings, right? I mean, because there's so much story, there's so much to learn, and, and not just learn, but like their essays.